Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Quest for Faith with Brian. And today I have a special guest, uh, Sammy from Call to Be Different for Christ, a YouTube channel. Um, fairly new in the YouTube space, but she's been blowing up. And if uh, if you've seen her, it's probably in shorts, because that's where I came across your content. And, uh, and I reached out to her because I just thought everything you were putting out was totally interesting and fun. And... I love interviewing people and in, in that have gone through the conversion journey the way that I, the, nobody's journey is the same, but going through that is definitely a different thing, especially um, I think in this day and age, people are looking for answers and hearing other people's stories, I think is so helpful. So Sammy, thank you very much for uh, joining me on my channel today. Uh, full disclosure, y'all, we had been going for 10, 15 minutes and I did not hit record because good times so uh take two for the beginning part of your story so uh anyway <laughs> so uh i think let's start off with uh kind of your early childhood um how you started uh your your faith journey going through growing up what that was like um and then we can kind of move into you know more more deeper stuff so um first off um yeah, so how did it all start for you? Like when you were a kid, how did you grow up? Okay, well, we're going to give you a little bit of grace, Brian, because thank at you. least we didn't do the whole interview. <laughs> Please, thank you. But, but um, I, I grew up in a household where my mom and dad didn't, they believed in God, but they didn't take us to church. And I shared that, like, when my dad he constantly traveled he owned his own business and so he was always gone and my mom just said that it got really hard once she had three kids to kind of get us all up and dressed and ready for church which i can totally understand that now that i'm a mom of three so that was kind of where um i grew up and then as i aged i just started having all these questions about god and i never felt satisfied in any answers that i got and i eventually um, around the age of 16, started working at the sandwich shop that was local here in our town. And I met a girl there who we be quick, we quickly became best friends and she just loved Jesus. And so the more that we hung out, the more I was just enticed by her. And I started going to church with her and um, with her friends. And that was just kind of how I really got started into Christianity. So that period of time before you met her, like what were some of the bigger questions you had that were just like, eh, whatever. Um, I can't find a good answer for this. What were kind of those things that were, that were uh, bugging you, I guess, when you're, when you're looking at, at your faith and Christianity and all that stuff? Well, mine were more like life questions. So my biggest question was just like, why are we here? Like, what mm -hmm. is our purpose? And Unfortunately, when I was growing up, like a lot of people in my family died when I was young. And so I got to experience like, what is death? And that was just really hard to go through. And we just went to funeral after funeral. And it just felt like, oh, this is just normal. And, and I don't know, it just felt really um, scary to me as like 10, 11, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And I just remember having a lot of anxiety and my parents just didn't really have like a purpose or Oh, this is why we're here. This is where we're going. It was kind of like, oh, there's heaven, and but there was really no like concrete statement yeah. or understanding about it. I completely sympathize with that. Like, even though I grew up in going to church all the time, like I had a a, a younger sister that died when I was ten, and I remember for me having faith and and kind of having my purpose be the Christian lifestyle, right. To, to follow Jesus and all that was so helpful for me to go through that experience. Um, now there's, my, there's definitely some other stuff to say about how my parents handled all that and everything. But like, for me, like I remember thinking, I'm so glad that I have Christ and I have my church and I have like my, the, this community that's supporting me during this time. And I, I remember thinking even, later on thinking back on it like that would have been so hard not to have that 
and yeah. just to be empty with that. And so I completely understand where you're going through, especially at that age when you're kind of starting to realize how big the world is around that age, right? Like it's no yeah. longer just my little community. You're starting <laughs> to realize, oh, wait, this place is huge. There's all these different opinions. I'm starting to hear different things. How do yeah. I process this? And then dealing with death in the family at the same time is just kind of, it is yeah. it is life altering. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I completely understand that. Um, that. Yeah, that must have been tough for you, you know, especially with your parents. I mean, that, that I'm sure a death of a child, I've seen people go through it and that's so yeah. hard. Like even as a parent to wrap your head around. So she they, was four so wow. she was really little. She had a cancerous brain tumor and oh. they can operate on it now. But back in 1990, like that wasn't even an option or 1989, wow. I think it was when she was diagnosed. So, um, but yeah, it was, I got to say when both of my kids turned five, I was super excited, right? Like, yeah. I, like <laughs> I made it past five. So Sorry. I don't mean to make you cry at the beginning. No, I did. That's. <laughs> But uh, that's that's a lot to go through. How old were you when that happened? I was 10. So I was oh. in fourth grade. So, yeah. and yeah, it was, it was really tough to go through because uh, it was a year long process of her eventually dying. Um, and yeah, it was, it was definitely a growing up period for me. Um, yeah. And yeah, it, it's interesting because there's not to get on to this story, but there's parts of like even education wise that I just didn't get in fourth grade because I was going through that. Um, oh, yeah. So like when my kids are doing fourth grade stuff and they're talking about these things in grammar and all this, I'm like, I don't remember any of that stuff. <laughs> and my wife's like, well, you were kind of going through some things then. I was like, You're right. I guess I, was, I don't remember things. So um, yeah, yeah, that's tough. I'm sorry yeah. you had to deal with that. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so so you met this friend and her just, I guess it's charisma that she had and love for Christ just kind of piqued your curiosity. And I love that because I really do think that is how we, uh, how we evangelize the world is the way we live and the way we yeah. act. Um, it, yes, the arguments are great. Apologetics is fun. I love doing it, but it really is those personal relationships that we gain that really convince people one way or the other right and and you hear that a lot when people have no faith and they meet a christian and they're like why are they different they're just seem to be happy like why um so okay so you're in high school you meet this girl you start going you become really good friends you start going to church with her then kind of what happened so we she was actually dating a guy in the military and he brought a friend home and so he her friend or his friend, um, we hit it off and we started dating. Now she had made such an impact on me that I was at the age where I hadn't like done anything with a boy. And so I really wanted to save myself for marriage. And so me and her, like she started down this path where she was going to get married to this guy and move to Georgia. And it just seemed like a great idea. So at 16, I got married. I moved to Georgia and crazy don't even know why i did that but looking back like um it was definitely a part of my story that i'm not ashamed of it's just something that i can speak out about now and go just hold on <laughs> like don't get married right. because it's such a huge commitment but i didn't understand all that and neither did she she was probably three years older than me so neither of us really knew what we were doing we were really really young and um, we moved down to Georgia and my relationship did not work out. And so I moved back and that's when me and her kind of fell apart. But, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, like her just living it. And that's something that had always stuck with me. So when I started um, looking back into Christianity after my divorce, I started realizing that there was more to it. And, um, you know, it even like broke my heart. Like it made such an impact on me the way that she lived that when I was thinking about divorcing my husband back then, I was like looking through the Bible, even though I didn't read it, trying to figure out like, oh my gosh, I can't get divorced. And like, but I didn't understand it, but it was really hard for me to go through because she was the only person I had to kind of lean on and go like, what do I do? And yeah. she was so young that it wasn't really helpful. 
<laughs> like right you guys are both just kind of young and dumb but yes at the same time dumb. like you know it's important right you know um yeah yeah so, something on my heart definitely told me like you should be doing it the way that the bible says i just didn't really understand because i didn't have the leadership in my life well and i think too with with that a lot of protestant churches yes they don't they they say like they definitely speak against divorce but they don't consider it a sacrament right like right. There, there's this fine line because once you upgrade it to a sacrament it's a totally different realm even though i i like even when my wife and i got married when you know we were well, see we were i was going we were both going to church of christ at that point um but we did like i always viewed it as i'm making not only a commitment to you but a commitment to god that i'm going to stay married to you like that was yeah. always my viewpoint on it um and uh so i kind of had that sacramental view on it but it still wasn't a sacrament not the same it, i didn't there is a difference when you go to that level right and so i think oh yeah um yeah anyway sorry i'm going on a tangent there but uh <laughs> so so you move back you you move, move back home um how long did it take you to start really kind of looking into it um after all that like to start getting serious about your faith like what happened next okay so after i got divorced um luckily we weren't together very long so our divorce was um like we didn't even have to separate anything other than like i took both of our dogs <laughs> because he was in the military so he couldn't watch dogs when he deployed um but that was uh, when when I came back home, then I ended up a couple years later meeting another guy and he was in drag racing. And so he was moving to Indiana. And so I followed him there and I started in drag racing and I started kind of living a crazy life. Like if you're in any kind of racing, then or you've ever known anybody in it. Um, it's kind of like drugs and alcohol and you stay up. You're you're just like constantly on go because yeah, you're pedal to the metal quite literally all the time literally all the time probably breaking way too many laws <laughs> so, right so were you um, actually drag racing or were you on the pit cruise like what were you doing were you what were you doing so i started um i started just like modeling and then i went to t-shirt trailer sales and then i moved up i actually i wanted to do the boys job no girls did the boys job but I wanted right. to do that. And so I worked really hard for like a whole year where I just went and helped tear down hospitalities for Don Schumacher racing. I did that for a whole year straight um, after my regular job and I did it for free and then that got their attention. And so they told me, well, if you'll get your class A CDL, then you can drive our, you know, Don Schumacher's actual hospitality trailer and you can travel the country with us. And so that's what I did. And wow. I did that for five years and then they gave me at probably like three years in from driving, they gave me a, um, the opportunity to fly in and out and then also do their accounting. Cause that's how I was raised. My mom, she was a bookkeeper for my dad's company. And so I knew all that side of stuff. So that was kind of how I got into flying in and flying out. But after doing that for five years and traveling home, I would see my parents and, they just kept aging fast. And I realized mm -hmm. I was missing out on so much and the world couldn't give me enough um, happiness. I was always chasing it and I never felt satisfied. And I just knew deep down that coming home and seeing my parents grow old, um, that's where I wanted to be. And I also couldn't, I couldn't have a dog. I couldn't have kids. I couldn't do any of that. Right. Um, because you you're traveling no so much. Right. So I quit and I came home and I'm glad that I did. Um, because my mom passed away uh, this year. So I got more time with her. Well, that's awesome. And so, I mean, not that your mom passed away. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, <laughs> I know that's, that's difficult, but <laughs> the fact that you realize that it's like this life that I'm chasing isn't satisfying. And because yeah. I think, I think everyone goes through that, right? Like to where they're chasing something else and they realize how empty it is whether it's uh, drinking boys, girls, whatever, you know, like just chasing something and go, I feel empty at the end of the day when I get home. 
Like this is not fulfilling yeah. to me at all. And then you realize, yeah. man, I need to go back to my roots. I need, I want to be around my family. Like I need some stability in my life to do that. And so you go back home to spend more time with your folks. Um, kind of what happened after that? Well, I, I kind of need to backtrack a little bit. So when I was living in Indiana, my brother had moved to Maine and he started, um, he followed a friend up there who, uh, he was a pastor. And so he went up there to uh, be a pastor for a church up there and he invited my brother to come. And so that my brother was just getting into the faith and my brother started evangelizing to me and he sent me a Bible. And so I would sit out on my balcony while I was in racing. And all we did was drink um, alcohol. Like that's just your life when you're in, yeah. in that kind of realm. And so that's all we did. And um it was, I think it's just a way for you to numb your situation because you know, it's not good, but it's like a dream job, right? So you should want to be in racing. And so even though you're not happy, you just numb yourself to reality at night when you realize, oh, I'm living the dream. That's not really the dream. And right. so that was kind of what we did. So my brother would call me and I were like, I still have the Bible where I would highlight things and it would be crooked because I was tricky. <laughs> It was so bad, but it got me into reading the Bible. So it started somewhere and God was just slowly planting seeds. And then when me and that guy started um, to, I wanted to move home and we were struggling in, in a bad, like he was just a really bad relationship, very verbally abusive, um, became physically abusive at the end. And it was just so bad that I had a girlfriend up there and me and her started going to church up there. And I thought about getting baptized up there, but I didn't really understand it. And so I ended up when I moved home, I started reading the Bible more and more. And I just couldn't put it down for the longest time. And then um, I started struggling again because I still didn't have any kind of structure. I didn't have a church. And then I started going to like elevation, which maybe you've yes. heard of it since you yes. live pretty close, which is a good stepping stone to get you into the church, but I wouldn't consider it a church that should be um, really looked into as something to grow your faith. And right. so I started going there for a little bit. And then when me and my husband actually met um, and we had our first son, then that's when I was like, I need to find a church. <laughs> I need to be able to have these answers for my kid when he gets older. And it just kind of lit a fire under me. And I actually looked at the church that I grew up beside, which was a half mile from us. And I started going there and I fell in love. And that's when I just started diving deeper. And I would sit down every morning and I would just read my Bible and I read it until I was done with it. It took me, it was yeah. like a two and a half year process of, because I wanted to study it. I didn't just want to read it. I wanted to study it. And so it was a really long process of me going through it. And that's kind of where I really jumped into it. So what, what, uh, I'm just trying to get everything straight. So what denomination was that that you were going to that was down the street from you? So we were Methodist. Okay. Yeah, I, I was, we went to Methodist church for a good six, seven years yeah. um, before we, before we moved over to the Catholic church. Um, yeah. I think that, that it's so interesting when you have kids, it just makes you grow up quick um, yeah. because you're no longer, it's like, Oh wait, somebody else I'm responsible for some, someone else. And, yeah. um, yeah, I definitely, um, can relate to that with having all of a sudden it's like, I need to know the answers. I need to make sure that I I've got my ducks in a row. Um, so kind of it's a it two year process of just reading the Bible and studying Were you just read, were you reading like, uh, um, were you reading anything interesting or just strictly sticking with the Bible, going to Bible class, that type of stuff, or kind of what, what was your thought process at that point? So at that point, like I'm the type of person, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to go all in. And so once I was like, I got to figure this out, I, it, I realized really quickly, like I can't read the Bible and just understand it. Like You can to an extent, but it's so deep and there's so much going on in it that you need more background and context. Yeah. And so I started going to Bible studies and I um, started reading like a lot of commentary and my brother and my um, sister-in-law, they're still really big into their church. And so they started giving me all these references and people I should look into. And they gave me uh, John MacArthur's Bible. 
his study Bible. And so that yeah. was something I, I used a lot. Um, and then that was kind of where I dived in the most. And I still kept going. I Like, I remember telling my husband, I would go to these Bible studies. And I would come home and I would say, you know, like, I was the youngest one at all these Bible studies. And it was mostly filled of like older people who were way older. <laughs> And right. they still seemed very confused to me. They seemed like they, they would still battle on like what was true, what was not true. And they still just felt lost. And it was very frustrating at times. Some Bible studies were great. Other Bible studies, it was like, do y'all even know what, like what this right. is about? And so I just kind of felt like everybody felt like that. Everybody felt like there's not a hundred percent answers out, out there. We just can get like 80, 90%. And then after that, we're, kind of right we have well, no idea it, what's going on and that's kind of the crux of solo scriptura right and looking at uh i mean even though methodist isn't quite solo scriptura right there um because mm -hmm. they have the hierarchy and everything but there's still as far as their viewpoint of studying the bible it's still up to your interpretation right like it's not um there are some some areas where it's like no this is what this means but there's a lot where it's like eh you know, and I think that's kind of the main reason we had the split there with the Methodist Church in the last five years. So, um, yeah, but yeah, I, I, I totally understand that and get that because um, you, know, you see that a lot. And I think when you're when you're the youngest in the room, you're expecting to have these old, these these elders in your faith have more <laughs> answers and be more locked in. And when yeah. you're like, they aren't. And they can't go any deeper than the surface level yeah. um, overview of the scripture. Um, yeah, that that is difficult. Um, I think so, it showed me too the struggles with solo scriptura because even though I didn't know what solo scriptura really was then, like I hadn't been approached with that um, idea, but it just showed me that like these women, they read their Bibles, they knew the Bible, but they could just quote scriptures. But even sometimes I would find myself teaching these ladies, you know, things that I had read or things that I had learned through commentary, through other people that were like scholars who um, had deep dived into it a lot further and went to seminaries. And so there was there was more than just like a surface level. Oh, you know, it was always just a we love Jesus. And that's mm -hmm. basically it. And it was like, the, I think there's more to this. It has to be deeper than just I love Jesus, period, the end. Right in that personal relationship deal right yeah. <laughs> um which yes we all should have a personal relationship with christ but yes i agree with you 100 percent. so what um so how long were you guys going to a methodist church we went there for five years five years mm -hmm. and then i guess kind of what at this point have you started looking into catholicism or what kind of sparked your way that way or is there something that happened in between there no so we were going and um like i said my brother was still a really big mentor to me and so he was he was sending me all these pastors that i did not know but they were all calvinist and um so we were <laughs> don't laugh <laughs> sorry i just um, uh, yeah no that's cool i get it <laughs> so we we were going we had we had a we had broken away from the Methodist church because all of their issues and we were non-denominational now. And our pastor who was in the Methodist community, he had just retired. And so he left when the church um, separated. And so we were left with like basically a youth pastor who ended up becoming an associate pastor who decided, well, now he'll be the pastor. And he was just for lack of a better term, not really good with his theology, at least not from what, my solo scriptura told me and so i really struggled with him and the more that we um, me and my husband listened to his sermons i mean if you've never been to a protestant church it's way different than a catholic church like i would sit like cross like it with my bible on my lap and i'm like highlighting and i'm writing and i'm looking on my phone and i'm like going through you know i'm basically doing a major bible study as he's talking and he would be so bad at his theology that i would just get frustrated and me and my husband would both just go off on our own little Bible studies instead of listening to him. And so at that point we knew we needed to get out of that church, but my mom was getting ready to pass away. She had just told us in November that she was quitting all treatments. 
And so it was just not the time for me to yeah. add one more thing to my plate. I was super pregnant with Coda and it was just way too much. And so I told my husband, I was like, I'll look at other churches, but I can't really like jump off the deep end and go try and find a church right now. And so that's what I was doing. And my brother kept sending me like all the references and churches he thought would be good, which ended up being more Calvinist churches. Mm-hmm. And then after my mom passed, we had Coda and then we started um, looking again into more churches. It was the time, you know, now we're ready. We can go find a new church. And my brother, we happened to be going to Ephesians at the church we were at. And so I just brought it up to my brother because I was like, I don't think he's understanding this correctly. Um, And my brother just nonchalantly said, you know, like you need to stop majoring in the or yeah, you need to stop majoring in the minor stuff is what he told me. And so I had asked them probably three more times and I got really mad at him. I was like, stop trying to mute the Holy spirit, Eric, (laughs) like just tell me what, what you're not telling me because I could just tell with him. I can tell when he's not being honest. And so he, he told me that, you know, he was a Calvinist and I was like, what's, what's a Calvinist. And so he started like, like it was almost like, every light bulb in his brain went off and he was just so excited to share this to me and with me. And so he started telling me what Calvinism was and he um, sent me, he tried to get me to buy a book, which I think it's called like mirror Calvinism. It's like a Mm -hmm. play on mirror Christianity. Yeah. And I thought about it. I was like, okay, well let me look into Calvinism first. And then I started reading what's Tulip and what, like what is Calvinism? And I really like shut down for about three weeks. I didn't know what to do with this information. And I just brought it to my husband. I'm like, I don't know what this is, but it feels like a heresy. And I was more concerned with my brother, to be honest with you. And so we started looking into it and it really sparked my husband. And my husband started finding all these Catholic channels. He started finding all the early church fathers and where they actually had fault, like, not necessarily the earliest church fathers, but down the line, they started fighting against the ideas of certain predestination types that Calvinism held. Yep. And he, he really started finding a lot more Catholicism. And so he started sending me stuff. And I remember him coming home one day and I was like, I, are we Catholic? And we just don't know it. Like, and so that was kind of where it started. And I was like, we can't be Catholic, you know? Because right. I didn't really understand Catholicism. I'd never been approached with it, really. But um, I was like, we just can't be Catholic because I'm not I'm not really even sure. To me, I thought that meant like a different faith almost right. from what I kind of understood would make about sense it. where you grew up, right? Like in the right. South, it's mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of churches don't consider Catholics Christians. And that's how my family talked about them. Um, yeah, uh, that that rings true. I, I can totally get why you'd have that that feeling. Yeah. So it was really him. He brought all the Catholic channels to me, like Trent Horn, Jimmy Aiken, How to Be Christian. And I just started watching How watching them Christian over and over again. Favorites. Oh, he's great, literally. His trolling <laughs> status is like next level. <laughs> it's fantastic. I, I love I that guy. Anyways, but yeah, yeah keep going. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. No, I can relate. He was so good, but it's, he was actually one of the videos I sent to my brother and I was like, you should watch this. And my brother just like shut down. He was like, I'm not, I'm not going to watch any of it. He's Catholic. He's, he doesn't have a degree. You know, he's just a cradle Catholic. He has like no seminary, nothing. And so he wouldn't even watch the guy. And I was like, I don't really understand. Like if this is your ideology, then you should be able to at least watch something and back up your beliefs. But my brother just wouldn't do that. He was just like, I don't believe it. And so uh, if you don't have enough um, years underneath your belt of going to some kind of school, then you can't be right about any of it. And I'm like, well, to me, it seems like he's right in a lot of it. And the Catholic Church teaches this, but I thought he would be the best because he takes things out of the Bible, right? And he gives you kind of an analogy and then he applies it back to the Bible. So it doesn't feel like a personal attack on everything that you know. It feels like, okay, we're just having a conversation. You're giving me a really great analogy and now I can apply it back to the Bible. And then it kind of opens your eyes to go, oh my gosh, am I wrong? 
And so right. that's why I sent that to him, but he just wouldn't even look, look at it. And then when we started talking about Calvinism together, he was like, shut down. <laughs> like, so we, we are having a hard time in our relationship right now because he just doesn't, he doesn't want to hear it. I completely sympathize with you on that. Cause that's my entire family. So, um, there, are, um, church of Christ is very, very anti-Catholic. Um, and I would, I don't know if they're as hard as Baptists. They're probably on the same level, right? <laughs> of, of, uh, of Baptists with that. Um, and so, yeah, my family, uh, will not talk about it. And, I was laughing. Uh, my parents came to visit last year and we were talking about something. And she said, like, I know a lot about the Catholic faith. And I was just thinking to myself, I'm like, if you did, you'd be Catholic. Like, you obviously don't know anything. <laughs> so can you just stop? And I, like, I know that it's a, it's a really hard situation because you love them. They're your family. But you know that they're not, their ears are never going to be open. Right? Yeah. Until... And it's like, do I waste my breath arguing with them over this? Or do I just love them as they are? And then if the opportunity live my life to try like your friend and live my life in a way in which my family sees that, oh, they're different now. Um, and then if the door opens, you know, rush in. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's tough. Like, and I, and I get it. Um, and I think, Calvinism has its own a lot of issues and even just Calvin as a person um I I never liked that guy so there's a lot in his in his theology and the stuff he did as a person leading his church in uh not Switzerland well it was Switzerland it was um what town was that anyways I can't think right now anyways but okay so I guess so this stuff started making sense to you, but what was the, was there anything that you and your husband had to work through that you're like, I don't know if that makes sense. That's a little crazy. Was there any big stumbling blocks that you guys had? Well, my husband grew up Episcopalian, so I think everything was way easier for him. <laughs> he just was like, okay, yeah, I, you know, he was basically at the top of almost jumping into Calvinism or not Calvinism, uh, Catholic, Catholicism, yeah, yeah, yeah. but he, his family just never went there. And his sister, um, like my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, they are Catholic. So we do have some Catholics in our family now. So that's nice. But, um, the, he dived in no problems. I struggled a lot with Mary at first. And so I brought, I bought a uh, Brant, uh, Petrie's, Petrie's. book. Mm -hmm. the and Prince of Mary, that one. Yeah, that one. And then after, it, it is so good. And then after I read that one, I read his one on the Eucharist. And at this point, we had already decided to join the Catholic Church. We went to one Catholic mass on uh, Saturday and we left and Jackson said, you know, what did you think? I said, I don't know what they're doing, <laughs> like, but I love it. And I can see that like from everything we had already studied, because we had already deep dived into Catholicism, we're, we're not the time, type of people that are just going to jump ship. I'm like, I'm going to study everything and make sure I'm making the right decision. So we happened to be going on Saturday and they were doing like a, a, a what do they call it? Like a ministry fair. And so mm -hmm. when we walked out, they were like asking people if you're interested in being a part of our parish. And I was over there signing up. I'm like talking to them like we would be new. We're RCI. We would have to do RCIA like we're Protestants. And people were like, oh, welcome home. <laughs> you know? Like I was like, I don't know what's going on, but you guys are doing it right. And so I want right. to come here. And we just kept studying and diving into it. And it was right after Easter. And so they weren't starting RCIA until after the summer. Until September. So, yeah. Yeah, so we had a lot of time to really dive into it, and that's really what I did. And I just started researching more and more and more of it, and I couldn't put it down because I was like, this is everything that I went to, all these Bible studies, all these women and men who had no real answers. It's here in the Catholic Church. And so it was like reading my Bible with new eyes, honestly. And I just had to... Um, just admit that there was a lot of theology that I had wrong, but that's because I was my own Pope and I was trying to interpret the Bible, how I saw the Bible right. to be interpreted. And it just and, got me into a lot of issues. And it's so funny. The, 
because I love it. So Catholics, you'll hear this a lot with uh, I was my own pope, right? That argument. Uh, um, Cause really it's your, you're, you're your own magisterium, right? Like you're, and so, cause I remember that phrase a lot of times growing up and that, and so I think that's a total common phrase for converts to use is I was my own Pope. It's like, yeah. Cause as, as Protestants, you think the Pope just says everything and directs everything and is infallible all the time. And how do Catholics even do that? Um, yeah. So the, the first mass, I, I find that, fascinating because it's so different than a protestant service i, I mean just night and day, night and day. even mm -hmm. if you're going to like a fairly woke-ish novus ordo parish and i don't think catholics that have never gone to a protestant service understand that how different it is and yeah like we even, go to novus ordos yeah, same here. So, like, our our parish says Novus Ordo and Latin. They they have both. So we're pretty fortunate. But, um, it's it was um, it was just so striking. And I think for me, and I, I'm curious on with your reaction to it. I felt at peace during Mass. Yeah. And I had never really had that that feeling. And I'm like, wow. God is here. Like Christ is here with us. Like I, yeah. I, you know, it was, uh, it was overwhelming, like how, um, how peaceful it was. Was that your experience or? Yeah, it just felt like home. It really did. I, and I couldn't explain it because I had been, I had visited a lot of churches in my life and yeah. walking into that church. I was like, I don't like, I didn't even genuflex because I did, I had no idea that was a thing. But yeah. just their reverence, I, you know, that was the first time I kneeled and like, I was like, I have no idea what we're doing <laughs> like at all, Right. but just the whole reverence towards it. And then I started learning, like, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? Like I immediately went home and started looking into why they were doing these things. And I would ask my husband questions like, what is the point of with your spirit? Like, what are we saying? And so we were looking up, what does that mean when we're saying that back? It's like giving a blessing almost in a way back to the priest because he just kind of gave a blessing to you. And it was like, what? This is crazy. And then they're like taking the Eucharist. Well, what's the Eucharist? And then it's like, oh, this is the body of Christ because they're eating the body of Christ. They're literally becoming the body of Christ in front of our eyes. Yeah. And I think um, that's what I love is, is there's meaning behind every single thing in mass. Nothing is just done because it's cool. Right. Like everything, there's a scriptural backing for everything that we do in mass. And yeah. it's eye opening when you start learning all of that. You're like, whoa, oh, that's why we do that. Oh, that's why we do that. Um, and even the procession being like the representation of of Christ carrying his cross to Calvary. Right. Like, mm -hmm. that's crazy. When I when that clicked in my house, like, oh, that makes sense now. And I always just thought it was, I don't know. I remember when I was a Protestant and I'd see Catholic masses on TV and they'd be holding up the Bible. And I was like, that is so weird. Like, why do they do that? Which is weird because it's all scriptura and Bible's the word of God. And it kind of makes sense. But I always remember thinking that was weird. And I love in mass that we, we do the, the um, there's such reverence for the gospel. Right. Like it's you have your Old Testament reading, then you have your psalm or your Psalms, your Old Testament reading, your New Testament reading. And then when you get to the gospel, it's like everyone stand up, like mm -hmm. everyone pay attention. We're about to hear the gospel. Um, and it's so it's so amazing. And I think and uh, I've seen this more in like Protestant churches more recently throughout the years is they'll do that. Some of them will do that. They'll be like, well, in reverence for the word of the Lord, let, let's stand. And it's like, now it's like, where are y'all getting that from? <laughs> because... Right. Did you think someone maybe have gotten that right 2000 years ago? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Mary was difficult for you. And you said that Grant Petrie's uh, book there really kind of helped you understand Mary uh, kind of what was, do you remember the argument or the, the not the argument, the um, the evidence that 
finally it clicked for you with Mary? Yeah, yeah. So the major one was just rereading the scriptures, looking at Luke again. What what is Gabriel saying to her? Um, looking at the brothers, what what does that Greek word actually mean? And the biggest one was realizing that she's the new Ark of the Covenant. That mm -hmm. was like mind blowing to me. I'm like, it makes a thousand percent. Like it just started, like you said, it was just like click, 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 click. Like everything just started going off. I'm like, what? <laughs> like yeah. just the typology is so deep in the Catholic church. And that's why like Sola Scriptura, you're not going to get there. Like unless you were Jewish and you lived 2000 years ago and you under like you lived in that culture, it's going to be really hard for you to just pick up your Bible and understand the Passover. It's going to be hard for you to understand the Ark of the Covenant. It's going to be hard for you to understand, you know, all these deep seated cultural things that I can't pick that out. Like I would never understand right. that because I didn't live then. So I need right. help. I need I need history. I need church. And I need the authority that was passed down through the apostles to help me understand that. Yeah. And, and Mary was, I, I had come to grips with the Pope and church authority because that was a big hurdle for me um, first. And, yeah. but I think being okay with that. And I think for me, understanding that Christ church is modeled after the kingdom of David um, really helped me understand Mary's role too as she is the queen of heaven because the mothers were always the queen of Israel. It was never the wife or the wives. <laughs> so, right. right. Uh, and then, uh, so that kind of really helped me understand her role. Um, I still remember we were already going through RCAA and I was I, praying the rosary was hard to get. Cause I feel like, I wish churches spent more time in RCIA teaching you how to pray the rosary because you know what it is, you know, the prayers and you can get those little booklets and then you're praying them. And I remember I was like, well, I guess I'll pray it, but I didn't really understand the mysteries and how to do all that stuff. And I, I would listen to Catholic radio while I was driving around sometimes. And it's like the flowery language that they use to describe Mary and some of their prayers and like, the Protestant in me was still going like, oh, okay, I'm mm -hmm. good. I'm good. And it just <laughs> took a while to understand everything. Um, yeah. I don't think that you're, if you're going to be a Protestant and then try to become a Catholic, it things like that are going to hang you up because you've heard it. There's so much that I didn't even realize was instilled in me. And I wasn't even raised in the church, you know, right. like I have only been studying it for probably seven years. Um, but even even I did one one video on the Eucharist and I said, you know, that like I was reading from my slide, but I said that that Jesus's body was broken for us. And that I didn't realize that like um, David, who I just did an interview with, he pointed out to me and I was like, did I say that? And then I realized I was like, where did that come from? That comes from the Protestant church that we went to when they did communion. That's what he would say. And apparently this is like something that was in the new or the King James version, but we know scripturally like Christ's body was never broken. And so it's right. actually almost wrong to say that. And so I'm like, that's just stuck in my head from hearing that. But why yeah. are they saying that? Like just yeah. little things like that. I'm like, I don't, I don't mean to say it. It's just in me. And you so I can out. see how, yeah, it's, it has to be really hard if you've been in it from you know a child and just hearing the same protestant teachings it has to be really really hard because it was hard enough for me to grasp mary um but honestly i think just looking at the history and the the sightings of her looking at um you know the incorruptible saints looking at the eucharistic miracles there's so much evidence that it, it's not made up like it that the would one, be impossible the our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Fatima, because I'd never heard of any of these things growing up at all. Yeah. And those two stories were the ones that absolutely made me go, okay, I'm okay with Mary. Because Mary was that one that was that topic when we were starting our CIA. Like I was already, I was on board the Eucharist first. And then I was like, am I going Orthodox or am I going Catholic? 
and then I was okay with uh, papal authority and the the Catholic teaching around infallibility. It's like, okay, I'm good there. You know what? I'll just go with it for now. I'll figure Mary out later. But then I heard those stories and it, it clicked to me what her role was and everything she does is always in line with God's will. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of Mary. And yeah. I think as Protestants, we just, Mary was just a girl that was lucky, you know, like, mm -hmm. like that Mary, did you know song mm -hmm. drives me insane now. Or it used to not bother me that much, yeah. but it's like, you know, the, the, the Protestants love that song during Christmas. Mary, did you know? Yes, she knew. Like read scripture. <laughs> they told her when they presented uh, Christ to the, uh, in, in the temple there on whatever day eight and yeah. the prophetess Anna told her what was going to happen. And so did Simeon. And hey, yeah. She knew and Protestants her. love that. They're like, where is it in scripture? Where, you know, it's always about like, I need to see it black and white. And then if you just say like, well, where's Trinity in scripture? That's not, that word's not written. You know, there's so many examples that are not in scripture, but we can conclude from scripture, from tradition, from like the early church fathers that there's some things that Protestants hold that are outside the Bible, including their Bible. <laughs> like yes. the, the actual book that they're reading is not written in the Bible. So you had to have the authority. And then for you to walk around and crap on the authority that gave you the scriptures that you hold so dear to your heart is ludicrous to me. And once I started like thinking about it just in common sense, I was like, this doesn't make sense. Why are we fighting against the very people who safeguarded this religion for us to even be able to crap on them for? Yeah. hundred. Uh, yeah. You're, you're spot on there. And I think, I mean, for me, the, actually the um, removal of the Apocrypha was the kickstart for my journey. I don't know if you've watched any of my stuff on that. Um, but that was like the first video I did on YouTube was the history of the, the, how the Bible was made, because that was like, that was the kickstart for me. It was the when learning that the Apocrypha was not removed from Protestant Bibles until the 1800s. Yeah. So Catholics and Protestants had the same Bible until mid 1800s. Yeah. And then and all now, of a sudden now, now it's they like, act it's like... only 66. It was never there. Like... I'm like. Yes, it was. It's insane. We all had that. And and to find uh, that the arguments, uh, Gary Machuda is a good friend of mine. Have you watched his channel, uh, uh, Apocrypha Apocalypse? All he does okay. is Bible stuff. And he, he he had me on the radio for for two years there before he uh, stopped doing his radio show. Um, and he, he went back to find the... Uh, Scottish Bible Society was the first one to kind of uh, promote the idea to remove the the, um, the Apocrypha. And one of the reasons was people are reading these books and becoming Catholic. <laughs> really? That's yeah. hilarious. Like he, he flew to England. So we got to nip that in the bud. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be cheaper to print because they're not scripture. They're not canon. So... Why don't we just do it because it's cheaper to print? Oh, yeah. And people are reading these and becoming Catholic. And yeah. He but he had to fly to England to find the meeting <laughs> notes of the society and make copies of them to bring them back, back so he could find them because they're not online anywhere. So he that literally had to fly to England to find that. So, um, wow. but yeah, I think uh, it, it's fascinating to me um, this disdain um, for. The church that actually gave you all the good things you have yeah you know and i think um who is it that has that analogy where it's like the catholic church is this giant ship going across the ocean and <laughs> people have have taken parts off that ship to make their own little ship and yeah. some of them get further away than others but you can still all see the the big ship in the distance and you're like Hey, where, what is that over there? And yeah, yeah, yeah I've um, heard it like Protestants are like the lifeboats on the sides or something. <laughs> like, yeah, and they're so not, they're still 
part of the mothership. They're just not on board with right. the mothership. And so like <laughs> everything good that they have, they got from the Catholic church. It's kind of that analogy there. Like you got it from us. Yeah. So have fun. Yeah. Um, I think what breaks my heart the most is that, and the reason why like I've continued on this channel because I don't know if you know much about why I started my channel, but I did it for my no, kids. I was literally um, going to ask you that question. <laughs> yeah. So I actually started for my kids. So if you go back to my like earliest ones, it's all about like called to be different. So my first one's like Adam and Eve, how they were called to be different by God and how they like how they stood out and the ripple effect that they caused throughout um, history. And so I just kind of wanted to make all these kind of, people throughout history who were in the Bible that God called to be different from the world and what kind of effects they had. And so that's what I started my channel for was for my kids so that they could stand on, okay, well, God did something with Adam. God did something with Eve. God did something with Miriam, with Moses, with, you know, like you, there's so many people throughout the Bible we could do this on, but that's what I started on. And then when the Calvinism thing happened, I, I got off and I just, I just realized that I didn't really know what I was talking about and I didn't want to say anything out into the world if I'm not saying it correctly. Um, so yep. it's to be on the internet and to say anything about Jesus, if you're misrepresenting the gospel to me, that's not good. And so I wouldn't be here if I thought that I was doing it wrong. That's why I didn't really do it that hardcore before. But after Pints gave me the shout out and after I kept looking into Catholicism, I I can't keep my mouth shut because I'm like, it frustrates me that I feel like so many amazing, wonderful people are Protestant and they shouldn't be Protestant. And when I was a Protestant, I just felt like I didn't have the fullness of the faith. And yeah. so I want I want to try and at least open somebody's eyes so that they will stop start investigating. Because if you investigate, I just don't see how you can't become Catholic. Um, but you have to do it with like an open mind. You can't just shut everything down and it's going to take time. There's plenty of converts that I've heard that it took years for them, yeah. you know, where it took me, I was pretty quick, but I also yeah. didn't have the, my roots weren't as deep into Protestantism. Um, so when sometimes I'll do shorts where I think my husband will go, well, that's not very charitable. I'm like, but I don't mean it like that. Like, I'm just trying to have fun with it. Because I'm not mad at Protestants today. I'm mad at what Protestantism is as a whole. And I think that's where people get confused. They think that I don't like Protestants. That's not true. The reason I have my channel now and continue speaking out on it is because I want Protestants to know the truth. Yeah. Um, but it, it's not nothing because I don't like them or I think they're heretics or they're wrong. I just want them to know the truth so that they know what's right because it sucks not knowing the truth. Yeah, and I and I've said this so many times, but like if all these hours you put into making videos and and you know with my channel too, it's like if I get one person, it's worth it. It's worth yeah. I mean, I've been doing this now for four years next month, and it's worth all the videos, all the hours, uh, you know, all the yeah. effort if it's one soul. And, That's the soul. Yeah. you know, and, uh, I, but I think, uh, yeah, I love your channel. I love what you're doing. Cause your, your videos crack me up when it's some, some <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's a good one. Um, and you're good in that space with the shorts, right? Like, I think we're, there's so many Protestant channels that are, that are really good at hitting those shorts and, and doing things like that. And, um, a lot of us, uh, in the Catholic YouTubing space aren't. And, yeah. um, and I think we need to get better at that and we can learn from you because you're doing a good job <laughs> in that space. So, um, I just like to have fun with it. I mean, I don't think I'm that good, but I've heard people, they've given me some props on it. So it keeps me going. Like I yeah. really enjoy the encouragement because sometimes I'm like, oh, maybe I am being rude or aggressive but i don't mean it like that like if you know my heart you know that i'm just trying to have fun with yeah it. and i mean sometimes you, it's a good way to wake somebody up right like yeah. i'll have a few uh um what did i i had one video on the eucharist i did where i think i titled it why protestants reject christ or something like that like i think that's how i initially titled it and obviously i don't think that but it was more of a shock value to like, hey, watch this video. Let me show you what, what I'm talking about. You know, um, you got to play that game a little bit. So, 
Yeah. Yeah, it gets so, them talking, and then they'll they'll throw things out there, and it's like, wait a second. And then you give them the truth, even if it's in the comment section, but then you don't see them come back. But I have had some come back, and they're like, you know what? I started watching your channel, and I just have to say I'm Catholic, or I'm going through RCAA, or whatever. Yeah. So that's so inspiring you know, to hear those stories, because I was that person. And thank God that there are people like you, like me, like how to be Christian, like thank God that these people are speaking out because without them, I don't think I would have become Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I think it's, uh, I think the more that we can speak out about our faith in a charitable way and speak truth and just always stick to that. Um, I, I think it opens the world up and I, and I really do think that we're in an interesting time and place uh in christianity where we have this platform i mean i I think about this right a big church is a thousand people and we both have more than that subscribe to our channels that get to hear our voice every day whenever we post right Right. now we might not get that many people watching every video but still you know like i'm thinking of of like a big church of christ church in california where i grew up was 300 people like okay like it's amazing the amount of people we can we can reach um by simply just hitting record on our phones at home and talking yeah and um and i i and I, i think you're the same way where it's like i'm not going to ever take that for granted that the words i'm saying need to have an impact and it i want i want it to have an impact so yeah. but i'm really i'm really grateful to see new new channels like yours pop up and start i it, it's cool and so i'm really happy that uh, your channel's being successful so um what's next on your agenda keeping up with just uh you got any big topics coming up you're going to do videos on so i'm getting ready to come out with my third video on the eucharist and that should be my final video on the Eucharist. I don't think I'm going to do a style like that again. (laughs) Well, maybe not like that kind of intense sit down. I'm not really good at editing. I wish I was, but I'm not. Um, I just don't have the time, you know, with three kids. Yeah, no, I get you. It's so it like it takes a lot of time to make videos, even to sit down and, you know, record a simple video. It can take you've been talking for an hour and 20 minutes, right? So yeah uh, and my dad's watching sure. my baby so <laughs> like, right good for him yeah he gets some grandpa time so there you go yeah so awesome so i'm going to definitely have your links in the description below so everybody please go over and check her channel out she's doing awesome stuff over there and sammy thank you so much for coming on i really appreciate hearing your story and your journey um and i'm just grateful to have another sister of christ joining the catholic church and speaking out for the truth and it's it's awesome. So yeah, thank you thanks so for much. Me. Yep. All right. Thanks, y'all. Please uh, like, share, and subscribe, and we'll talk to y'all later.